Welcome, all you happy warriors. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Great to have you along. All of you, and yes, every one of you, is a happy warrior. Warriors, because life is an exciting challenge and struggle every single day. And the only alternative to that, the only end to the struggle, is one you don't want. And the joy we take in the struggle makes us all happy warriors, men and women, all of us. So thanks for being part of the show as we explore the role we each play in our own problems. That's right. I am preparing this show for you during the biblical festival of Passover, uh, which is a a seven-day holiday. And right in the middle of the holiday, I've been very focused on this central message. I want to tell you that this message, which is the core message of the main Passover observance for the people of Israel, which is the Seder night. The Seder observance is a special meal at which an entire specific liturgy and ceremony is observed. And the Jewish people have derived two things of inestimable value from this annual, if you like, inoculation process. One of them is that we have absorbed a continuity principle. Now, what is a continuity principle? Well, it's something that at the moment imperils the United States of America, it imperils Sweden, it imperils Holland, it imperils the Great Britain, the United Kingdom, it imperils most of the Western world. Um, It is far less dangerous in some of the countries of Africa that I know and also some of the countries of Asia. What am I talking about? The failure in the West of acculturating young males to society. Uh, A part of that very much involves an awareness of history. And at the moment, speaking about the United States of America, but it's also true for other countries, young males have almost no knowledge whatsoever in the origins of the nation and certainly zero passion for it. Now, you might wonder why I'm speaking about young men and not young women. And the answer is for exactly the same reason that the overwhelming majority of people on death row are men, not women. That is not for sexist reasons. And you'd have to be a particularly repugnant and dumb form of feminist to insist that we must have parity, sexual parity or gender parity on death row. We need more female murderers so as we can even up. Oh, stop with that rubbish. (laughs) Um, The reason there are more men on death row is exactly the same reason that there are more men in the ranks of chess masters, the great chess players. It's why uh, there are more exciting games in men's basketball than in women's basketball. It's very simple, and that is that the way the good Lord created human beings on this planet, and that's That's my choice of how I see it. You may see it differently. But what we will surely agree on, regardless, is that men and women differ from one another in how we appear at the extremes. In other words, the reason there are more men on death row is exactly the same reason as there are more men in the grand master rank of chess players. In other words, uh, men outperform women at the extremes, not in the mid-range where most of us live, but men in the extremes. Tall men are much taller than tall women. Um, Hefty, strong, well-built men are much heftier and stronger than well-built women. Uh, You will not find a, a national 
uh, football league made up of, of women players that could take on a, a team of men players in the NFL. It's not doable because NFL seeks out the biggest, strongest, most talented men in the country, and they are going to be a whole lot bigger and stronger and more talented at football than a similar, than the very best grouping of women. Uh, the In terms of um, crime and violence and brutality, uh, men in general at the extremes are much more violent and uh, dysfunctional than and psychotic than women are at that extreme. They just are. And um, similarly... At the, uh, at the chess playing extreme, when you're up at the grandmaster level, I'm not saying that your daughter couldn't become a grandmaster. She may well be able to, but there are far more men at that capacity of play than there are women. All right. So it's, it's a case of extremes. At the extremes of the bell curve, uh, men are, uh, men, predominate and are far more numerous than women are. And I think that's something everybody would agree with. So our main problem is acculturating men, not women. Uh, to put it bluntly, dysfunctional guys can destroy the country, can destroy society, can destroy the world. Uh, dysfunctional women, far less so. There are fewer of them and the extremes of behavior that they aspire to don't even come close to what men do. Uh, to, put it, uh, to put it bluntly and directly, and I know there are exceptions, obviously, and I'm, I'm not trying to provide a scientific and mathematical provable proposition, but, uh, but in general, guys who are not acculturated, guys who do not become civilized men, become killers, uh, callous murderers, and brutal psychopaths. Women who do not become acculturated have children out of wedlock and pass bad checks. I mean, that's basically the difference. And if you don't believe me, then just think about what happens if, you know, imagine for the moment that the city in which you live has a really bad part of town. I hope it doesn't, but let's imagine it does. And let's imagine you were down there at two o'clock in the morning and your car broke down and your cell phone ran out of battery. And you're standing outside your car, scratching your head. What are you going to do? Like, how are you going to get gas to fill up your car? What, what, you're in such a fix. And you notice at the other end of the alley, silhouetted by a streetlight, you find four figures approaching you. All right. Would you be relieved as they got closer to discover that they were women, not men? I think so. Would you be relieved to discover that it's not four men, but it's two men out for a walk with their wives. Would you prefer that? You follow. Women are more civilized at root and civilize men through marriage. But uh, single men, hugely problematic for any society. Any society. And so what the Passover Seder experience has helped the Jewish people do is acculturate their young men. Now, there are a lot of different aspects of it, and I, I, you know, I dealt with this at the Seder that I was privileged to lead recently, but I'm not going to go into that in great depth now, if you don't mind. I'm going to tell you that it has a little bit to do with a phrase that crops up in both Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy several times in the Old Testament, and that is the phrase that reads, when your child will ask you, when your son, it says specifically, when your son will ask you, uh, or you shall tell your son, uh, you shall teach these words to your sons. There is a whole lot in the five books of Moses related to this fundamental principle that there is a social moral obligation on each man to acculturate the sons that he brings into the world. Obviously, his daughters too, but that's a, it's not a challenge. It's so much easier. But to acculturate men is an enormous challenge, very, very difficult, and one really needs to know how to do it. How to raise boys into men? See, how to have a boy is easy. 
right? It's about 30 seconds of concentration, nine months before the boy is born. And then you've got a 50-50 chance of it being a boy. Done. But to raise a son, somebody who will be your son, that is much, much more challenging, right? Anybody can conceive a boy. All you need is a willing woman. Any guy can conceive a boy. Uh, you know, do it twice, you've got a 50-50 chance each time. This is not a problem. But from the moment that that boy is born, to turn him into your son, now that requires data and information. It requires, uh, you've really got to know exactly how to do it. It's very, very difficult. So that is part of the gift of the Seder experience on Passover. And uh, at our website, uh, you will find more information on that, um, including the fact that none of these secrets require you to be of any particular faith. You don't have to be Jewish. These are principles that are timeless and that help each and every person who wants to avail themselves of ancient Jewish wisdom's success strategies uh, to bring these principles into your family and learn how to make sure that your male child turns into your son. That's a different story altogether. That is part of the Seder experience. The other part is even more central to what we should be discussing in the show today, and that is the following. Look, uh, I want to tell you something now that is very painful to hear, but I don't think you need me to sugarcoat the truth for you, do you? I don't think that's why you listen to this show. I don't think you want me to do nothing but massage you with warm butter. I think you're willing to accept a little pain as part of the price of learning how the world really works. Look, if you uh, are unfortunate enough to have you know, some kind of, of disease you're battling with, you know what? It's not your fault. I'm sorry for you, and it's, uh, you know, it's the way it worked out. If you are somebody who's lost your hair and you are bald and you're unhappy about that, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry for you, but this was just the ovarian lottery. Most likely on the male side of your parents, uh, your father or your grandfather, there was probably male baldness. You got it. I'm sorry. It's nothing wrong you did in your life, okay? That's just, it's just how the world is. However, and here comes the painful part, my friends, and, uh, and it, it really is painful. If you have financial problems today, this is because of bad decisions you made yesterday. I'm going to repeat that, not in order to inflict more agony and more suffering upon you, but in order to try and drive home this truth, because every morsel of your psyche is trying to reject this. It is so awful to contemplate. It is so horrible to accept that you right now are grappling with cognitive dissonance. Every shred of your psychology is trying to reject what I'm saying as an untruth. And so I'm going to repeat it one more time. Health problems, God forbid, baldness problems, not your fault, no problem, no need to even talk about them. But financial problems that you may have, you brought those about through bad decisions you made earlier in your life. Might have been last week or last month. More likely it was last year or two years ago. Might have been 20 years ago. Might have been 30 years ago. But you made really bad decisions. And that is why you have financial problems today. Is that okay? Like, can, can you accept that? And if you can then you really are able to move forward on these principles. 
And uh, I, I want to share a little with you as to how this emerges from the Passover Seder experience, uh, which might help you accept this principle right into the pores of your skin, into the molecules of your blood, and into the hollow spaces in your soul. Because recognizing that the name of the person responsible for your financial problems today is the person whose name and photograph is on your driving license. As hard as that is to accept, that is the key to recovery. That is the doorway to rebuilding. That is the first step in success. Before I go further into that, I want to remind you that the website is called rabbidaniellappin.com, and I want to tell you that uh, right there, right there in the website at rabbidaniellappin.com, you will find available a fantastic resource called the Income Abundance Set. Uh, That contains the full program of restoring financial stability through revenue enhancement. How do you increase the amount of money you're bringing in every month? That's the key. It's called the Income Abundance Set. And I am sure that this will bring blessings and value to you, or if you don't need it, and that would be wonderful if you don't, than to someone in your family or someone in your orbit of influence who does. And you thereby can join hundreds of thousands of other people who have transformed their lives, getting rid of financial stress through the principles of the income abundance set. And you will find that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Okay, so make sure you head over there, read about it, and see if I'm right. I think you will find that, yes, this is something that somebody in your life really, really needs. It is truly life-transforming. Now, uh, what is it? It's the book, Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commands for Making Money. It is the uh, book, Business Secrets from the Bible. You know, 40 Principles for Financial Abundance, and it is the audio program Boost Your Income, and it is the audio program Prosperity Power. There are some things you have to absorb through reading. There are some things you have to absorb through listening, and all of that is included in the Income Abundance Set. So head over to rabbidaniellappin.com, okay? Now, I said I would tell you what the next important step that emerges from the Passover Seder experience is, and I will tell you that now. Look, um, this is the very first step in the deliverance. This is the first step in transforming your life, and that is recognizing your own role in where you are. Uh, What is interesting is that um, this is not uh, unique. It's not as if, I mean, this fundamental truth, um, it's not as if nobody who's not Jewish knows about. It's not true. Um, I read recently a beautiful letter that Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders of America, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter on March the 12th in the year 1799. And this is 23 years after America gains independence from Britain. And uh, he wrote, Thomas Jefferson wrote the letter to Thomas Lomax, who was uh, at that time a member of the Virginia Senate. And in the letter here was this sentence. Listen to this. The most important part is the last seven words. But I'll read you the whole sentence. The body of the American people is substantially Republican. But their virtuous feelings have been played on by some facts with more fiction. They have been the dupes of artful maneuvers and made for a moment to be willing instruments 
in forging chains for themselves. It's fantastic. Do you hear that? Thomas Jefferson is saying as early as 1799, there are already people, politicians, who are maneuvering people through fiction to do things and accept deals that make them willing instruments in forging chains for themselves. In other words, people are willingly becoming enchained, enslaved, not literally, but to their political rulers, to financial imprudence. These are some of the things that Thomas Jefferson is talking about. And that's exactly what we're discussing. Now, look, everybody with any familiarity with the Passover Seder, and I know that this year over 40,000 churches in America are celebrated a Passover Seder. And so, yeah, obviously hundreds of thousands of Jewish households held a Seder, but who knows? how many thousands of Christians also attended a Seder held at their own church. It's a very, very popular observance. So I know that some of you listening, at least, will know the retold story of the Jews being slaves in Egypt, and God said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. And Pharaoh refuses, and there are uh, ten plagues, and finally the children of Israel go out and they're free. Now, everybody knows that story, but um, how did they become slaves in the first place? And did they actually become real slaves? Well, wouldn't you have thought that the word for slaves, which, by the way, is the Hebrew avadim, don't you think that word should appear in the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis, Exodus? The first 12 chapters of the book of Exodus talk about the Israelites in Egypt. They talk about the birth of Moses. They talk about God speaking to Moses of the burning bush. They speak about the uh, uh, Egyptians making the Jews work very hard and putting on tax collectors on them and imposing confiscatory rates of taxation. That sounds a little familiar, does it not? And uh, it culminates finally with the 12 plagues and the exodus. Wouldn't you have thought the word slaves should show up in the first 12 chapters of Exodus? Well, they don't. Not a single time. Not once does it say. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel slaves for them. Or the children of Israel became slaves to the Egypt. doesn't say that. Not one time. So where do we find in Scripture the children of Israel actually becoming enslaved in any way whatsoever? And the answer is that you actually have to look at the book of Genesis. Last chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 21, uh, what happens is that Joseph has his brothers come to him. And in verse 21 of chapter 50, they say to him, Excuse me, excuse me, I'm, I gave you the wrong verse. Chapter 50, verse 18. The Joseph's ten brothers, eleven brothers, say to him, We present ourselves before you as your slaves. We're, we're eager to be your slaves. Read it. It's unbelievable. And wouldn't you have thought that Joseph's response to his brothers in chapter 50, verse 18, Joseph should have said to his brothers, Now listen now, my brothers, You are free and independent people. Stop that nonsensical talk. You're not going to be my slaves. If anything, you're in servitude only to the Lord. But other than that, you're free and independent men. No. For reasons that I cannot go into in this short program today, Joseph actually says to his brothers, the words used by tyrants in every generation to enslave people. Fear not. I will sustain you and your children. You've got nothing to worry about. I'll take care of you from the cradle to the grave. I will give you a job. You have a right to it. I'll give you decent housing. I'll give you medicine when you're sick, and I'll educate your children. Don't worry. Fear not. I will sustain you and your children. Isn't that when you listen to politician forums, especially in the lead-up to elections, 
it breaks my heart when I hear pundits from the news networks saying to political candidates, and what will you do for us? What will you do for poor people? What will you do for people of this particular skin color or that skin color? What will you do for you, these people who have male organs of reproduction or those org- female organs of reproduction? What will you do for... The real answer, which probably won't win you many votes, is I will do absolutely nothing. I will simply do my best to keep the government and other people from interfering with your freedom to go about and do and accomplish the very best you can do and be. That's really the answer. But no, politicians leap into it. Oh, we'll do this and we'll get you this and we'll get you universal basic income and we'll get you increases in your pay and the union. Oh, it's we'll take care of you. That's what Joseph said to his brothers. They said, we're willing to be your slaves. And Joseph said, it's a deal. In exchange, I'll take care of you. Well, isn't that what you always do with your slaves? Of course, you feed them. You uh, you give them medicine when they're... That's what you do. Because you want them to be able to continue working for you. And that's exactly what we have today. Government undertaking to take care of us in order that we can pay more and more taxation so that government can spend more and more and more of our money. And we fall into the trap and we willingly say to them, hey, we'll be your slaves. You just got to take care of us. And government quoting Joseph in Genesis 50, 21, fear not. You got nothing to worry about. I'll take care of you. And what's more, I'll take care of your kids as well. You don't have to worry. And, uh, Therein lies the frightening secret of the Passover Seder. Wow! Yes, the Israelites were complicit in becoming slaves. And that's one of the reasons that the plagues did what they did. Let me ask you, for whose benefit was the plagues? Like, who was the main audience of the plagues? Do you think it was Pharaoh? You know better than that. If you know anything at all about the book of Exodus, you know that on several occasions, Pharaoh said, okay, uncle, I've had enough. Take them out. I can't take any more of these plagues. And the next sentence is not, and Moses led the children of Israel out. No, it's, and God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Why? Because the main audience were the Israelites, not the Egyptians. You see, Taking people out of slavery, my friends, is much, much easier than taking slavery out of the people. That willingness to exchange freedom for security is a scary, scary thing. And it's something we are all very susceptible to. The roles that we all play in hurting ourselves, in our fearfulness, in our grasping at the straws of security and thereby surrendering our freedoms. In other words, playing frightening and destructive roles in forging our own chains. Thomas Jefferson put it that way, and the Passover Seder puts it in broader and more general terms, but the principle is the principle, and that is, yes, we're all sadly and tragically capable of being complicit in hurting and harming ourselves. Yes, sadly and painfully, the financial unhappiness you suffer from today is the direct consequence of bad, bad decisions and mistaken actions you took yesterday. I don't know how long ago yesterday was for you or you or you. Each and every one of us knows and can identify the mistakes we've made. And avoiding that is certainly less painful, but it also makes sure that nothing will change. Identifying and recognizing our own complicitness, our own participation in our own misfortunes. Oh yeah, that hurts, but it also heals. That hurts, but it also leads the way to deliverance and redemption. 
recognizing that fundamental point. Oh, it is so very, very important. And uh, the, uh, the most important point of the value of the Seder experience, in addition to acculturating our children, which is part of it, because when you see clarity in the future, when you see that you have a son who is worth leaving something to, when you see that you have a son that it is worth creating a legacy for, that drives you to levels of achievement that the person without a son can never hope to come close to. I'll tell you exactly what that is, but uh, first of all, we need to uh, once again uh, urge you to engage in a financial transaction with me, a financial transaction in which we both prosper. I sell you the result of my work, and you use it to enhance the revenue, the finance, and the wealth creation of you, your family, or of somebody you care about. So head over to the website at rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, stop in at the store. You will be looking for a resource called the Income Abundance Set. The Income Abundance Set consists of two absolutely crucial volumes. One of them is my book, Thou Shall Prosper, and the second is my book, Business Secrets from the Bible, and it consists of three hours of audio training, which you will use repeatedly while you're exercising or while you're walking or while you're commuting or while you're on an airplane, whatever it is. Uh, that's why it's in audio form. You need to be able to hear it again and again. Those three hours are also part of the Income Abundance Set, which is available to you at rabbidaniellappin.com. So be good to you. Be good to me. That's the beauty of a financial transaction, that we both emerge from it happier than we were before. I sell you something that improves your life, and you buy something that improves my life through your act of buying it. All of that at rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, onwards to the, the point here. Okay, so look, um, the, I think you will agree, would you not, that if I ask my child, or you ask your child, hey, please look for my car keys. They're in this room somewhere. I came in with them. I haven't left the room. They're somewhere in this room. Your child will look with considerably greater diligence than if you say to your child, please help me find my car keys. And your child says, where would I? I don't know. They're somewhere in the house. Will the child look with the same diligence? Of course not. When you know that something is right there, you've just got to keep looking for it because it is right there, it's attainable, it's somewhere reachable, the level of diligence, the level of purposefulness with which you pursue your objective is hugely in enhanced. It's a big, big difference. And so it is that uh, if you know that it is possible to achieve a financial transformation, then you're going to go through the steps of getting there with a totally different mindset than if you just don't really, you know, I've tried a whole bunch of different things. This might work. Maybe it work. You're like the child who's told to find the keys and not told where they are. Uh, the enthusiasm just isn't there. And so the, the idea in the Passover Seder uh, translated into slavery terms, is that um, it is witnessing the possibility of redemption that makes it possible for me to take the steps to free myself from my own Egypt. Do you follow that? Think about that just for a moment. And the principle becomes very much a part of what you're doing the actions you take today not tomorrow or next week the actions you decide to take today to change your financial destiny 
And one of the things you understand is that improving your financial destiny is not a selfish act because the only way to really do so is by changing the conditions and circumstances of God's other children. When you become obsessively preoccupied with filling the needs and desires of other people, that is when you make money. You don't take money, you make it. And when you are able to wrap your psyche around these ideas in such a way that you are ready to take the next tangible steps in your own deliverance, well, then you're good to go because you can see the path. It's not as if the path leads into a dark forest and you have to take it merely on somebody else's say-so, that if you keep following the path through the dark forest, well, yeah, you'll probably come out at the other end to a bright, broad, sunlit meadow of happiness and contentment. Maybe. No, it's not like that. The path is clearly lit all the way. There are no dark forests on the route. There are streetlights all the way. There are beacons guiding you from one step to the very next step and taking you from darkest Egypt to the brightest circumstances of stress-free, bright, contented deliverance. That's what we're talking about here. And, uh, and that's why the income abundance set that I'm talking about is so effective and has been so effective for so many people because it's taking the principles that have served the Jewish people wonderfully well for 2,000 years, really, really well. And, uh, and one can see, yes, it is true. A lot of my compatriots, a lot of my fellow Jews, my co-religionists, are very uncomfortable when I point out that Jews are and always have been disproportionately good with money. You know, that's not because they're circumcised. It's not because they rip people off. It's not because they eat certain soul foods. No, it's because they understand the thousands of tips and tools, the techniques, the strategies that are embedded in the Hebrew Scriptures that are useful in day-to-day -day life for showing how the world really works in the area of wealth creation. And our income abundance set has condensed all those many tips and tools and techniques down to 10 chapters in Thou Shall Prosper and 40 chapters in Business Secrets from the Bible. So for a total of 50 principles, and I'm not saying you can absorb it in three days and then move on. No, it is going to take a little time to absorb it. But that makes sense, right? You didn't, you didn't expect a quick fix for maybe years of misinformation. No, that's not how it works. And so uh, what the, the Passover experience helps us understand is, number one, that one has to build an eternal future. Let's put it this way. God forbid, let's imagine somebody who discovered that he's going to die in one week. Would a person like that get married? Of course not. Would a person like that invest in something exciting, a new company? No. Would a person like that sit down to design a new app? No. Would a person like that build a house? No. Because he doesn't see a long-term future. Now, by contrast, imagine if there was somebody who discovered that through a genetic accident, he was going to live forever. Think about what that means. All of a sudden, if somebody tells me that this investment is going to bear fruit in 10 years, fine, that's great. I've got a long horizon. I'd plant trees. How long will it take before this orchard of avocados is going to yield me beautiful avocados to eat every dinner time? Well, it's going to take 10 years. No problem. I'm good with that. It all depends on your time frame. And so if you are able to see your future stretching ahead through your children, 
because they're not just male fetuses or female fetuses they are your sons and your daughters if you can learn no matter at what stage to link your future to that of your children to derive immortality through your children if you can learn those techniques and those tools then your entire outlook in how you throw yourself into effort and achievement has changed all of a sudden you're a different kind of person it's utterly different and furthermore if you are able to derive some of these tips i'll give you an example of one notice that moses and god never said to moses let my people go moses never said to pharaoh let my people go one of the fundamental lessons that emerges from the seder and that i teach in much greater detail in the uh, in the um, financial abundance set i was telling you about at my website one of the key lessons is yes moses never said let my people go every time he said it it was let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert now i don't know what your particular egypt is right i know what my own are you know what your own are but to give you an idea an egypt can be uh, somebody who's having marriage difficulties marital difficulties an egypt can be somebody who desperately wants to be married but isn't married um, uh, egypt can be uh, family problems egypt can be substance addiction egypt can be a pornography addiction uh, egypt can be financial stress egypt is anything that prevents you from achieving your god-given destiny right remember and i think i've told you this that in the lord's language in hebrew there is no word for hero no word for hero you know why because it's a bad idea you shouldn't have a hero you know why because the word hero means you are thinking to yourself maybe you're even saying it to yourself which would be ghastly but at least you're thinking to yourself, oh, he's my hero, or she's my hero, I want to be like him, or I want to be like her. Uh, that is not part of God's plan for you. God created you with your own fingerprints, and he created everyone else with their own fingerprints to stress in the individual potential. We are not supposed to be like anybody else. There are many people I admire, and I must learn inspiration from them, and I must learn tips and tools. I must learn ideas from them. I mustn't try and be like them. They're not my hero. No! I've got to try and be everything I can be, not what anyone else can be. And so we've got to use every way of escaping our own Egypt, using these principles and these strategies. And the principle i'm just sharing with you now to give you an idea of what i teach uh, this is also true in my coaching programs and it's true in the income abundance set uh, to give you an example as i said moses never said to pharaoh let my people go because you will never get out of your egypt if the whole purpose of it is just getting out of egypt god please help me solve my financial stress God, please let me overcome my alcohol problem. God, please let me get married or fix my marriage. Okay, for what purpose? Let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. Got that? There's always got to be an uplifting purpose for what it is you're hoping to achieve as opposed to just a selfish release from pain, from stress. It's not just, oh, God, please let me escape my addiction. It, it bothers me so much. No, it's God, please let me escape my addiction. That way I really will throw myself into being a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better partner, a better boss, a better employee, a better sibling. There's got to be a purpose. Oh, God, please let me find my match so I can enjoy a beautiful marriage like all my friends. For what purpose? So that I can focus on bringing joy to another human being. And that maybe we'll be blessed to bring children into the world who we'll acculturate to be our sons and daughters, not just male or female offspring. That's right. 
You get the idea? My friends, it's all very doable. These are the principles that I teach. The website is rabbidaniellappin.com. Please make sure you're subscribed to the emails we send out every week. Please make sure that if you have any questions to ask or anything you want to tell me, right there at rabbidaniellappin.com, you can reach both Mrs. Lappin and myself. And above all, you can visit the store and take a good look at the resource entitled The Income Abundance Set. And through that, you will be able to decide whether this is something that can bless you, your family, or somebody close to you. My friends, it is, as I say, the holiday of Passover that I personally am in the middle of, and um, I've, uh, I've very much wanted to share with you some of these Passover lessons that are useful to people of every background or of no background at all. And that is my entire purpose, sharing how the world really works through revealing the secrets of ancient Jewish wisdom. That's what I'm here for. And so coming to the end of today's show, I wish you a week of very good times with your friends and your family, with your faith and your finances. That's right. I'm your rabbi. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.